1917, in what is now southern Manitoba, representatives of the British Crown prepared to meet with members of the Cree and Chippewa nations. The intention was treaty making. The object was land. The British authorities told the Cree and Chippewa they needed land for settlement. The Indians asked, how much land? The phrase used in the reply was, as far as one can see daylight under the belly of a horse. This poetic description was an attempt to bridge the cultural differences between the two parties to the treaty. But the final result was only vagueness. Treaties such as the Selkirk Treaty were a regular feature of the colonization by the British of what is now Canada. In the 16 and 1700s, the soldiers and sailors of France and England attempted to destroy each other in a long series of wars for international supremacy. Their battlegrounds included the territories of New France and New England, where settlers with the help of the Indians were by then trapping, trading, clearing farms and building towns. When the wars reached the New World, Settlers on both sides of the conflict quickly affirmed their friendship with the Indians in an attempt to secure fighting allies, or at least guarantee Indian neutrality. The British formalized these guarantees by writing them down in agreements of peace and friendship. From the earliest days of European exploration till the late 1700s, there were eight of these agreements drawn up and signed by both parties as European legal tradition dictated. The last of these wars between France and England raged for seven years and changed the face of North America forever. The spectacular fortress of Louisbourg fell in 1758. Quebec, the heart of New France, fell the year after. Any French hope for control of the New World was dashed. At the end of the war, King George III of England issued an important directive on Indian rights. Now called simply the Royal Proclamation of 1763, this document played such a central role in the definition of Indian rights, it is sometimes called the Indian Magna Carta. It confirmed that a vast area in the interior of North America was Indian country, and would be preserved as hunting grounds for the Indians. The eastern boundary was formed by the Appalachian Mountains, but the western boundary was left undefined. King George ordered that no one could use these lands without the public permission of the Indians themselves, and only the Crown, or its authorized representatives, he said, could actually acquire the land, if indeed the Indians were willing to part with it. And so, in a single brief document, a British monarch had laid out the basic formula for treaty negotiation in Canada. From this point on, the British Crown would be the central agent in the transfer of Indian lands to colonial settlers. And land was something that settlers would be looking for plenty of. During the American Revolutionary War, at least 40,000 American settlers remained loyal to the British Crown. When Britain finally surrendered the American colonies to local forces in 1781, these loyalists, suddenly traitors in their own land, had to flee. They came north. And they came looking for land. But under the provisions of the Royal Proclamation, no land could be given to anyone before Indian title was cleared. So the government machinery for treaty making quickly got underway. The Royal Proclamation said that the Indians had rights in the land, that individuals could not come up and make deals with Indians for the land. The land could only be alienated to the Crown at a general meeting for that purpose. And what followed was a series 
of land surrenders or land surrender treaties, if you like, which were the means whereby the Indians gave up their land for settlement purposes or whatever else the Crown wanted to do with the land. There were a total of 31 Indian treaties signed before Confederation in an attempt to secure rights to the lands in what was then called Upper Canada. The colonials recorded their understanding of treaty provisions in writing. The Indians recorded their understanding in stories, memories of promises made in the sacred time. Some tribes, particularly those in the East, embedded their vision of the treaty in wampum, precious beads which themselves took on a sacred character. No matter how they were remembered, most of these treaties were drawn up and signed in a hurry, sometimes only days, and there were often tremendous weaknesses in them. A famous example of sloppy staff work was the gunshot clause of a treaty prepared in September of 1787. The Crown was attempting in one maneuver to acquire all the lands north of Lake Ontario between present-day Kingston and Toronto. The Indians were prepared to share their lands, but they wanted to know exactly which lands were involved. The area in question was described to them this way. From the lake shore, as far inland as a gunshot could be heard on a clear day. But whose gun? Whose ears? And what season? Winter or summer? The terms were too vague, and the Indians declined to deal further. The gunshot treaty fell apart. But most treaties didn't. In the 1840s, Surveyors and excavators found rich deposits of iron, nickel, and copper on the shores of Lake Superior. Access to these minerals meant wealth, and local mining companies appealed to the Crown for support. So the government sent in William J. Robinson and instructed him to extinguish all the Indian titles to the land. Why were treaties struck in the first place? Why were treaties made in the first place? You know, they were made for a simple reason that the crown, the sovereign, recognized that they did not, they did not have title to the land, that the title remained with the Indian nations of, the, of, of Canada, that that's who had the title. Now, in order for the crown or the sovereign to settle the land, they had to have access to this title. They had to gain title to the land. And the only way they could do that was through treaties. In 1850, Robinson quickly concluded two treaties with the Ojibwe, one near Lake Huron, the other near Lake Superior. The Robinson treaties were the forerunners of all treaties for the next century. They contained provisions for annual payments to Indian bands, freedom to hunt and fish on unused lands, and they reserved special areas for the use of the Indians alone. Confederation. A nation is born. A young nation among many older nations. And a new nation with a voracious appetite for real estate. The Americans were stretching west as well, and quite possibly would look north in their search for fertile farmland. The Canadian prairies were a great temptation. And so the race began. Under the authority of the new federal government of Canada, treaties were signed clearing the rights to all the land between Ontario and British Columbia. All the treaties after Confederation were numbered. One at Stone Fort. Two at Manitoba Post. Three at the northwest angle of Lake Superior. Four at Capel in present-day Saskatchewan. Five at Lake Winnipeg, six in the Cree territory stretching across Saskatchewan and Alberta, and seven in Alberta. With these seven treaties, the gap between British Columbia and the rest of Canada was closed. All possibility of American encroachment from the south had been cut off. <laughs> 
The signing of the numbered treaties was a great administrative victory for the young Canada. Unlike the Americans who had butchered their native people in a series of bloody and costly Indian wars, the Canadians had accomplished their settlement of the West diplomatically, peacefully, fairly. Or was it fair? Back in the 1830s and 40s, Buffalo had roamed the prairies unhindered, 50 or 60 million by one count. For the Indians of the plains, these huge beasts had provided food to eat, clothing to wear, shelter from the weather, and medicine for their ills. For thousands of years, the buffalo was a way of life. But when the whites came, the buffalo became a business. The end was inevitable. And the end came fast. By 1880, for all practical purposes, the buffalo was extinct. The Indians knew that there were far more of these people further east and that they were coming west. They knew that the cards were ultimately stacked against them in terms of sheer power. So in that sense, they, you could say that the treaty was forced on that group of people. But the idea of treaties was something that Indians themselves wanted. Why, you might ask, would they want treaties if they, if they understood them as giving up their land? Well, first of all, they didn't understand them as giving up their land. And secondly, they saw the treaty as a mechanism to protect them for the future. Starvation and disease quickly took the people of the plains from proud self-sufficiency to a grim dependence on the will and whim of the white man. And signing a treaty was the quickest way to get help. The treaties were basically signed because they were forced to. They had to sign. A lot of the times they didn't want to sign the treaty. They didn't want to, to agree to the treaty. But because of starvation, because of disease, you know, the people were dying. Our Indian people were suffering, and they felt by, by signing the treaties, by getting these annuities in place, you know, they could buy blankets, they could buy food from the Hudson's Bay Company. They could get the things they needed to look after the people, to look after their band. It was assumed that with the buffalo gone, Indians would settle down and begin farming. So a common feature of treaties was the setting aside of lands known as reserves for the exclusive use of the Indian people. The size of each reserve was proportional to band population. But whether the population should be counted at the time of the signing or at a later date when the Indians might choose to begin farming was a subject of great debate. Indian people couldn't leave the reserves till the 50s. So in, in effect, they were <laughs> captives in their own, their own land. They were prisoners in their own land. They had to get a permit to leave the reserve boundaries, and they had to get that from the Indian agent. But the initial intent of the reserves was a place where they would be protected. You know, their way of life could go on. Now, 70 years after the last treaty was signed, a lingering issue is whether the size of a reserve should have been pegged to a single census, as it was, or be changed to meet the growing needs of a band as its population increased. After land, a major concern within treaties was education. It was well known to the Indians that the only replacement for the buffalo would be schooling. They asked for schools and teachers. They asked also for medicine. The horrors of epidemic tuberculosis and smallpox are almost unimaginable today. With no natural immunities, native bands were easy prey for disease. Sometimes, smallpox would carry away half a band in a single season. These diseases had all been brought to the Indians by the whites. At the time Treaty 6 was signed, the famous medicine chest clause was inserted at Indian insistence that the Indian agent should keep a medicine chest at his house for use. Today, Indian thinking is, this means medical care in general terms. The medicine chest may be all they had at that time in that place, but today we have a broader range of medical care, and this is a symbol for that. The interpretation of that clause is very different 
between the federal government employees or bureaucrats and the Indian leadership. Because to us and to our elders and to our leaders that negotiate and sign that treaty, it refers to health care and health benefits for our people. And because our traditional way of healing was, is still present and alive, but we recognized that we would need that assistance. With the disappearance of traditional sources of food and shelter, many treaties offered annuities, annual payments of three, four, or five dollars a head, which might buy blankets, tools, and provisions to help the Indian people survive the winters. A continual demand of Native nations was that the sale of liquor on or around reserves be utterly prohibited. The advent of whiskey had been almost as destructive as the loss of the buffalo, and unscrupulous white traders took full advantage of the natives. Even at treaty signings, whiskey traders hovered nearby to quickly separate the Indian from his treaty payment. Once medicine and emergency assistance was promised, it wasn't long before the agreement was reached. Treaties 1 to 7 were concluded within six short years, but clearly, the bargaining positions had hardly been equal. For 22 years, no new treaty activity occurred, for no new land was needed. But in the 1890s, business boomed once again. And now the business was gold, the stuff of dreams pluck it from the earth and retire a millionaire. They stumbled on gold in the Klondike in the 1890s, and the rush was on. The Indian title had to be dealt with, of course, and access to the Yukon fields could only be gained through treaty. Treaty number eight, to clear title to the Yukon access route between Edmonton and the gold fields, was negotiated with the Cree, Beaver, and Chipwean. These groups were gravely concerned that once they signed a treaty, they would be expected to act like white men. They didn't want to pay white man's taxes, nor fight against the white man's enemies. But the treaty commissioner, David Laird, assured them this would never be the case. We assured them that the treaty would not lead to any forced interference with their mode of life, that it did not open the way to the imposition of any tax, and that there was no fear of military service. This verbal promise, duly reported by the Chief Commissioner to Ottawa, does not appear in the treaty itself. But the Indians who signed were comfortable. They need no longer fear either taxation or conscription. In order to get the Indian people to agree to sign the treaty, in order to get them to agree to sign their X on the, on, on the dotted line, so to speak, they were given the assurances that Quote, unquote, you would not be subject to any imposition of any tax, nor enforce military service. That's in the Treaty Commissioner's report to Ottawa. Now, it's written down there, and it's verbally talked about through all the number of treaties. The elders will, will make reference to it. That was one of the promises. No tax, no, you know, no enforced military service. We will not have to do that. We will not have to pay that. We will not have to endure that. But then along comes a GST. No, it's, it's, it's a federal tax on everybody, including treaty Indian people, which goes against our understanding of treaty, our, the spirit and intent, and our understanding of treaty has been breached again. The year was 1920. Wealth that Yukon gold diggers had only dreamed of came spurting from the ground in the Northwest Territories. The discovery was oil. As always, rights to the land had to be acquired before the resource could be tapped. Treaty 11 in 1921 cleared title to the oil-rich territories from the bands more recently known as the Denny Nation. Or at least, that's what the government thought. Half a century later, the Denny were able to successfully argue before a Canadian court that Treaty 11 was essentially an accord of friendship and peace and not of land surrender. Given the different expectations of the signatories in treaty negotiations, the different approaches, cultures, needs, and even different mechanisms for recording what was agreed, it is not surprising that the terms of Canada's Indian treaties have been the subject of continuing debate. 
Now, while the written treaty talks about yielding, ceding, giving up, surrendering the land, this does not seem to be the understanding that Indians at the time had. For example, in northwestern Ontario, the Indians there told the commissioners, tell us where you want your roads to run, tell us what pieces of land you want, and we'll, we'll make those arrangements. They were not talking about yielding, surrendering huge bits of territory and then being given back reserves. They were telling the commissioners the reverse. Tell us what land you require and we'll arrange to give that to you. Our understanding of what was surrendered was this, the topsoil. Because we recognize as Indian people that the Europeans wanted to farm it. So that's part of the negotiations. That's part of the agreements. That's not in the treaty but it was talked about and it was verbally agreed to. So when we talk about the sharing of the land, when we talk about uh, what was surrendered, that's all that was surrendered. The right to come in and use the topsoil to farm and settle it, that's what was surrendered. The relationship between the First Nations and Canada as a new nation has been defined in part through some 70 agreements and treaties which took place up till 1923. Every single one of these treaties is still in effect. Not one is expired. Because they are living documents, they will probably always be the subject of debate and interpretation. But no matter what the controversy, they will continue to serve as a fundamental statement about the way we relate as cohabitants, sharing in a resource of land and riches that the native people of Canada have always regarded as precious and worthy of respect. The important thing that Canadians need to know about Indian treaties are that they, they form an obligation of honour on the part of all of us to attempt to understand what it is that Indian people understand about these treaties and what it is they expect of us and what it is that we should be doing to try to fulfil those obligations that were made uh, for us many years ago. We do, as Aboriginal First Nations, have a special relationship with the Crown. We do indeed have treaty rights. And they're here for as long as the sun shines, the rivers flow and the grass grows. They will not be terminated. They cannot, there is no end to that. They are here forever. And people have to realize and understand that, what those rights are. And the more awareness, the more education about them that can be taught, it's more beneficial for both Indian and non-Indian people so that we can peacefully coexist in this country, that we can share the resources together. Our treaties deserve constant study and review, for like any bond between people, they are only helpful as long as they reflect the ongoing realities which people face. Situations change. Our response to those situations must also change. Perhaps by studying the treaties of the past, we can better understand why problems arose and work towards more effective, compassionate, and realistic agreements in the future.